Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to the Kiwi Lads channel. In this video, we have got an extremely special one. Norm Maxwell, he has decided to join us once again. His birthday is just around the corner, so we thought, why not interrogate him with a whole heap of questions coming from you guys. Cool. <laughs> Welcome into the video, mate. All right, yeah, nice to see you, brother. You too. Are you excited for your birthday, first of all? Uh, not really, mate. Just another day. <laughs> just another, another day, day. Another, another year ticked off. 46. Mm -hmm. 46? Getting old. Getting old, Don't mate. Like a day over 35, mate. <laughs> That's a little bit of sucking up we've got to do because some of these questions are a bit rough. <laughs> first question, you're ready to go. Yeah. We'll start with this one. What is your favourite international and super rugby team to play against? That is from jo uh, Bob Jeff Dog. Uh, okay, so favourite international team would probably be, I uh, still like playing against South Africa, it was probably my favourite team to play just because of their physicality, so just like to get into the game, you know, so it's, uh, you feel after after one of the South African games you felt like you played a game, so nothing yeah. was there coming off the field, <laughs> feeling like you've done nothing, you know, so against yeah. the South Africans, um, I used to like that because it wasn't that difficult to get into the game, you know. Um, and the uh, the Super Rugby, they're all. Uh, I used to like playing all the New Zealand rugby teams anyway. Yeah. Um, just because they're a similar style, you know. So, um, yeah, just in Christchurch, uh, playing a home game was always awesome, you know. So the games against Otago, they're always going off. All the New Zealand teams are good to play against. I guess this is actually a perfect segue from the Springboks. And that is, okay. how would you go in your prime against the current Springbok side? That is from my uncle Russell. So if I, if I was playing within the, the the All Black team now, yeah, it's a tough one. Is this a tough question? That one, <laughs> it's because it's the last time I played was two thousand and four. So I like to think I'd be all right. You know, obviously you'd have to do like um, you know, you'd, you'd be able to adapt to it. But um, I think I'll be okay. So Very you happy. think if Eben Etzebeth was in front of you? And he was getting right up on your face. You think you'd throw it straight back? Yeah, I didn't know that is, man. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, I was a sort of a, probably a, more of a modern style player back then, you know, when I first yeah. started. So um, I think that um, I'd, I'd be okay in the modern game, I would say. All righty. So my uncle, he asked one other question. Yeah. And it's, a, it's an interesting one. These are his exact words, by the way. Okay. Do you remember the piss up in Canberra when the mighty Cam Tabs bet the Brumbies? Uh, he's talking about the 2000, I suppose. The I 2000, so. probably when we beat them over there. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we had a night at the uh, didn't leave the hotel. I think it was at the casino. So I don't know if he was there. Were well, your uncle there? Was he? Uh, yeah, he was. <laughs> he was. Okay. Yeah. So maybe he had a few with him. Mm. Yeah, that was a good night. There was a uh, there was a, after we won it for the third time, so that was a, uh, a repeat. I think we stayed over there, but we came back because before that, in 1998, we, we were the first the first uh, final we we beat the uh, Blues and we we chartered a flight back to Christchurch that night. We were yeah. right back in, man. Town was just pumping that night. That was like the first ever. It was it was a bit of a surprise. And then 99, we won it, and then 2000. Uh, we won it three times in a row, yeah. So then we came back, I think, the next day. But the first time we came back to uh, um, from Auckland, the the airport was just like people were packed, packed yeah. in the inside of the uh, inside of the terminal. There was like condensation dripping from the roof. It took us like about an hour to get from the the airplane all the way through. I don't know. There wasn't that many restrictions back then, but uh, it was just mayhem. Yeah. But then in two thousand, they had it all sort of cordoned off. They I think they learned from their lesson from the, the couple of years before. See, that's something that's probably changed a lot in recent history as well. Like, even now, with the fact that they aren't allowed any crowds at the games just in current times, like, you kind of lose that special player to fan reaction. And like, yeah, that's, know, right. that's right. That's right. Yeah, moment. there is a bit of that's right. Exactly. Yeah, I think the gap between the um, between the grassroots sort of rugby player and fan and the professional players has gotten wider and wider, you know. Yeah. Like I, I think I mentioned it last time, and the before the rugby park, like the, the the training ground we had was always open, you know. It was just uh, the doors, the gates were open, anybody could go in there. We yeah. started, 
the other thing was everybody used to run on the field as well, you know, straight after the games. Public would run on the field. They did yeah. that for a few years and then slowly they sort of they just sort of I don't, I don't know why they did it for some reason. Some some sometimes for convenience, sometimes I don't know. But um yeah, yeah you're right, sort of got a I just remember that time in 98 when we came back because I'd hurt my thumb in the game. People were just grabbing my hand like, uh, <laughs> I was just really like, oh, no. <laughs> People were crazy, man. Another question that we have got, and it is actually to do with what is your fondest rugby memory? And that was from Ali. So I guess, would you say that that one coming back from the airport is right up there or do you have one that tops it as well? There's a few good memories. I suppose it all depends, you know, some cool games and some interesting games, uh, like the 2002 game against uh, the Waratahs. You know, it's quite a famous game where we scored 96 points. Yeah. That was a very interesting ex- experience. They were they were second on the table with the last round robin game. We sort of just came out and it just was just a freakish game, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just scored, I think we scored 14 tries or 16 tries or something like that, just one after another. It was just a weird sort of, I think it was 63 nil at halftime. So it was uh, something that was just, a, that, was a, that was an interesting game to play in. Another game we played in again in, um, for the Crusaders was against um, the Cats. Cats came out and they scored like 26 points in the first 20 minutes. So we were behind like 22 points or something like that. And then we came back and scored 52 unanswered points. That was a pretty awesome game. That was up in Nelson. But, um, yeah, it's, just, it's hard to know. 98, that was an interesting one, an interesting season where we beat the Sharks in front of the Pack Stadium in the semifinal. I remember Norm Berryman scored an awesome try that game. But um, I don't know. It's just uh, there's a few different things that sort of stand out. I don't know. Even some of some, some of the hard times, you know, when we lost against the French in the, in the semifinal, you know, you'd look at it and think, well, man, this is uh, – uh, a tough experience, but also it was a growing experience, you know. So yeah, these are sort of uh, important moments of uh, growth, and uh, they sort of everything sort of goes on to the next thing, you know. So you can look back; some of the victories are good, but sometimes the defeats are just as good because they sort of lead on to other things, you know. So I feel like that's a great way of looking at losses as well, rather than looking at them as you know, like oh, we could have done this better, or we should have been able to win it. You're going right. This has happened now, so we might as well use it to build towards our next experience, such as, I mean, the All Blacks and the Rugby World Cup 2023 coming up very soon. We've got a couple questions yeah. about that as well, but, of course, getting yeah. knocked out in the semi-final for 2019. It's going yeah. to be an interesting World Cup in France. In fact, that one is. Next yeah, question from David the Mod. Okay. Who is going to win the World Cup? Or... How are they going to go in the next World Cup for the ABs? That is a combination of a Brandon question and a David the Mole question. Yeah, yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? This is this isn't it the big? Uh, it's the big thing, isn't it? Um, yeah. I think some some of it is like for me, uh, they put a lot, there's a lot of emphasis on the World Cups, you know, for some reason, uh, and it is important, but um, game by game as well is important, you know. I mean, sort of yeah. sometimes you can get lost to sort of be, you think too far ahead for this one special moment and it, you put a lot of pressure on it and, and I think that with the All Blacks it's sort of like the, we just got a proud history of just performing each time you know um, yeah. and, I, and I, don't, I don't really like to get into that mentality of like oh, World Cup, World Cup you know it's, it puts a lot of pressure on us as well but um, in saying that I'd, I'd like to, to hope that New Zealand you know sort of wins um, but you just never know do you Mm. So one of the big things is just there's just the pressure. Because I know that we've got France in our pool, which is actually the opening game of the World Cup. And with you being in Spain, any chance we get another Maxi from the sideline little video? Yeah, it could do. Yeah, well, that was part, partly my missus' inspiration. She was the one that hounded me to uh, go to that game. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm sure that she'd be keen to uh, repeat that. So, yeah, if I'm, if I'm there, I'll definitely... Uh, like a few more videos through you. So yeah. you mentioned about Norm Berryman a little bit earlier on. So big question, yeah. funny Norm Berryman story from Joshua. Have you got any that come to mind? Okay, yeah, yeah, there's a few. Probably, yeah, just one that I could uh, repeat, you know. Um, <laughs> Norm, Norm is a bit of an interesting guy because he's, he's, he's from the same club as me. He used to live up the road from me, like a couple hundred metres up the road from me. 
Yeah. He went to sort of um, so we went to the same uh, we did the same rugby club, the local rugby club. Uh, uh, he he left to go to the King Country when I was playing for Northland. But then he came down to the Crusaders, and then I don't think no, I never played with him at Northland. So we have a bit of a connection there. Um, but funny Norm Berryman story. I think it was it was after one of the I can't remember what um, championship we won, but it might have been the two thousand. Super Rugby uh, final, and we had, uh, Norm was looking after the uh, the trophy. We had the trophy with us, and we had one of the. Uh, we went out that night. It was like a I think mean, it was Sunday night or something like that. And we came back. Uh, Norm Berryman. There was another guy there. His name is Ben Hurst. Ben Hurst is a uh, used to play halfback. He's a real character. He was only a young fella. He just got pulled in for the last game. He hadn't been with us the whole year, but Justin Marshall, I think he broke his Achilles in the semi-final or something, and so he came in for for the last game where he was on the bench or ended up playing anyway. So he's a bit of a character. So when he gets on the on the alcohol, uh, uh, Hurst, he's just like um, he's just like one of the funniest guys you'd ever meet. You know, one of the sort of loving, sort of funny like characters. And anyway, Norm Berryman was uh, he was in the in the garage and we heard this Bing Bing and. He came out like a teeny sound, and he came out with the with the trophy, and it, the the dropped it on the ground and broken the handle off the super super twelve trophy, yeah. and uh, we sort of looked at each other, and we and this was in my place in crisis, and we and we both looked at each other, and we looked at uh, Ben Hurst, who was um, sort of trying to rest from the night out that we just we just come home from, and uh, we both thought the same thing. Well, we'll blame it on him, you know. <laughs> Oh, no. And anyway, so we started kicking him. We're like, oh, Hirsty, Hirsty, you broke the trophy. And uh, Hirsty's like, no, 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 I didn't, I didn't. And we're like, yeah, you did, you did. And um, we, we go, we got proof, we got proof. And he's like, nah. And uh, then he goes, hey, hey, hey. hey let's, what about if we say somebody else did it? You know, <laughs> we started like <laughs> cracking up because he was trying to get get us to blame somebody else. Anyway, so that was uh, that. Was that. <laughs> and we, we didn't think much of it. And then in the morning, uh, we woke up and Ben must have woke up early. He was like sweating, stressing himself and he was trying to glue the glue the handle back on the trophy again. And uh because we had the we had the um the uh what do you call it, the parade. And so we had we had to have the trophy for the parade, you know. So that was happening that day. So Hirsty had been up early, freaking out about breaking the trophy, and he he got the super glue out and tried to glue the handle back on, <laughs> and all, that, all the way along. Me and Normie were like laughing to to, to each other, and then uh, when as soon as we got to the parade, one of the boys grabbed the trophy and bumped the handle, came rip, ripped off it, and so anyway, and then it ended up being on the news. They said, oh, they said, oh, Ben Hurst broke the trophy, like on the news, and, like we didn't tell it. We didn't tell him for years uh, that it was normal, did it? <laughs> and we just blamed it on you. But uh, yeah, so that's a that's a story there about Norm. But Norm was always a bit of a character. He was just like a freakish player. Um, could do things that nobody else could do, and at the same time, sort of like uh, what what wasn't the the hardest trainer. I'll put it that way. He was more of a natural talent, you know. So sort of back then, he sort of. Uh, but at the same time, I, I don't know. It was um, uh, it's just yeah, it's just, it's just some natural flair that you can never train or never teach anybody, you know. So you did tell Ben Hurst that. Yeah, he found out. He found out a couple of years later. I can't remember how he found out. We sort of, but um, yeah, we always laugh about it now. So yeah, but the funniest thing part for us was him trying to blame it on somebody else. <laughs> 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 Let's just say somebody else did it. But mm. uh, yeah, that was a that was a uh, that was a classic. So you mentioned about being on the alcohol. We've actually Very got well. it's it's a bit of a double question, and they're two separate direction question. First one is what is your favourite type of beer? Second one okay. is who's your favourite rugby player right now? That's from Tesla. I don't really, I don't drink anymore, so um, I haven't drunk for years. Uh, not that I'm against it, uh, I have, you know, but uh, doesn't really treat me that well. Um, but if I was to drink beer, I would probably drink Tui. Oh, yeah? Uh, um, uh, just because it doesn't really give me, like, a big hangover. But like I said, I've, I'm a uh, new man these days. And uh, what, was the, what was the last question? Who's my favorite? Uh, 
Uh, my favorite rugby player is Richie Moanga. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice Good playing player. this I like, weekend. I, I like White Lock as well. White Lock? Oh, how yeah. many caps does that man have now? About 138 yeah. or something. Yeah, he's up there. He's up there. Nice guy. Mm. Then we've got the next qu- uh, question, which is, what is the funniest slash craziest thing that happened on the All Blacks tour bus? That's from Katie Dixon. Uh, All Blacks tour bus. Yeah. Oof, <laughs> nothing really. Uh, it's crazy what happened. There would be like, back then, sometimes there would be, like, it would all depend on the mood, you know. <laughs> if, you get a, if you had a loss or something like that, it would be like a bad mood. But a few times there was a few like sort of scuffles, I suppose you could say. Guys get in there, you know, they've had a few too many or they end up sort of like, uh, they charge the back seat because there used to be like a hierarchy, you know. The older guy yeah. back seat and uh, we had a couple of times that I remember there's something going on. I never used to get involved in anything like that too too, too much, you know. But uh, guys trying to take the back seat so there'd be like a few fists flying around and <laughs> guys get butt burns and stuff. It's, uh, Everyone gets very serious about that back seat, don't they? From like literally primary school all the way up to the All Blacks. Everyone wants yeah, that yeah. Back seat. Well, I don't, I don't know I if it's know. that way anymore. You know what I mean? It's sort of like yeah, that was. A th- I remember I watched a there was a guy doing an interview recently, and he he played in the All Blacks in 1994. I think he was one of the guys. He was talking about it and what the atmosphere was, was like and all that. You know, I saw yeah. that just before professionalism sort of came in. It was a different sort of style, you know. There was like, um, I don't know, like when I first sort of started out, you know, you got the older guys and then you got the younger guys, and then the older, the older guys treat the younger guys like shit, and you know what I mean. You got to prove yourself, and you, you pretty much get told what to do. So when professionalism came in, that sort of changed, I think. You know, I remember Wayne Smith, one of his things, he played for the All Blacks in 1981. You know, so one of the things that he hated was that sort of bully, bullying sort of atmosphere from the older guys to the younger guys, you know. And so he never wanted that in his in his team, you know. So it was a big priority for him to sort of stamp that type of behaviour out, you know. Yeah. Um, and so that was part of it, the whole back of the bus, the old guys and the young guys and all that. So but I think it's disintegrated now, you know, with professionalism. They spend so much time with each other talking mm. 30 years ago now. So I probably wasn't even a thought 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> I've got another question here. Who was your biggest All Blacks idol growing up? Yeah, well, I used to like... Um, John Kirwan, yeah, yeah, so even though I was uh, forward, um, yeah, so I love John Kirwan, yeah, I remember he scored the awesome try against the Italians, like from the kickoff, it's quite famous, I used to love his style, man. Okay, so I've got an interesting one, you may or may not know Johnny Blaze from some of the live streams. Yeah, yeah, I've seen him. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so his question this is this is one of those ones that you probably, there's the question at the start, but then it's got the slight story behind it. Do you ever go back to Raweni? That is the question. But afterwards, he's got, if so, why is there a lack of tinny houses around? I hate driving all the way to Waimamuku for herbs. <laughs> <laughs> is that right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, my my dad actually lives there. Um, so, yeah, I go back, uh, every time I go back to New Zealand, I'll go and spend um, a lot of time. In, uh, uh, the, I was born in uh, Rawini, uh, same with my father and my grandfather, in the hospital, it's the local, local hospital there. In terms yeah. of the tinny houses, um, <laughs> it's probably more who you know there um, than anything else. Um, but, um, so it's probably just not in the know. I'm sure there'd be a few around, but uh, yeah, it's not that's not my. Uh... <laughs> I was gonna say I wasn't expecting an honest answer about the second part. But yeah. <laughs> there you go. Another question we have got is: Who was the most vicious player you have ever played against? Yeah, there's a few sort of. I suppose you you have to put them in different categories, you know. Yeah. Because there's some hard players. Like I was thinking that today, Kim Kim Milamu is like a hard player, you know. Well, one of these, I don't know if you know if you have you ever heard of him before. You know uh, he yeah, is? fun story there. We actually went to the WWE in Auckland, and he was in the front row. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so one of these players, and there was uh, Sam Tutupo as well. 
there's some players that are just hard players that every time you play against them, you know, they're just going to be hard every time you come in contact with them, you know? Yes. Uh, and they're going to be going for 80 minutes or however long you're on there, and it's just going to be competitive, you know? Um, and then you've got the dirty players, which mm. is cheap. The cheap shots, you know what I mean? And so now there's no way you could get away with it. Back when I first started, you got people standing on your head, trying to pull your eyes, punch you in the head in the line out, you know? Um, I remember one guy who was renowned for being quite a, uh, you know, sort of one of those type of players, yes and no, uh, was Smiley Barrett. So that's uh, the Barrett's father, you know? So he was a... He, he was renowned for being quite, uh, um, you know, like a bit of a hard man in that, in that way. So you got old school guys that they tried to put you off for, through like physical stuff, you know. And the yeah. first time I remember, the first time I marked him in the line, he tried to punch me in the head like the first line out. Just, just went, just as this, like just the ball came in and just, he just tried to knock me and just to put me off, you know. So there's yeah. a few different, there's a few different tactics like back then. So there's, uh, I don't know, there's lots of different players that sort of had that type of mentality. Um, but that got sort of squashed out early on. I remember, I think it was 1996, I think that first season uh, was about like, we had other guys. We played against the Blues and there was a fight that broke out. Charles Rokeman punched one of the bo- our boys in the head and, like, and one of our other guys chased him and it was a bit of a thing going on. And back before then it was like no problems, you know. People getting punched in the head all the time. You wouldn't even get yellow counter for it, you know. And yeah. uh, and they ended up getting suspended and all that. Like they got like four weeks off and like didn't get paid. And everybody was like, "Oh, what's this?" You know. <laughs> and that was the end. <laughs> it was the end yeah. of it, you know. And so before that, it was yeah, it was an intimidation thing. Like people trying to put you off, you know. Um, mm. Especially in the lineouts and things like that. Um, there's one like a funny video. I don't know. I, I, I might send it to you. If I can find it, but even with the commentators, it was the Northland playing. One of the guys came in and he boom, he got punched, he got knocked out. And the commentator was like, "Oh, that was a good left hand." And <laughs> the way that they talked about, it, they tried to pick him up, and nothing happened. But he was like flopping on the ground. And I was, I'll try and find you that that clip. But it just shows you how far the the rugby has come from then. You know, mm. I remember when I first started playing um, club rugby, like the coach that we had like a move. Well, it was like in a in a scrum, like the first scrum, like we wanted to try and intimidate the, the opposition's uh, front row, and um, so he, my job was I didn't I, I wasn't gonna uh, bind up with my lock, and as soon as they went down, I was gonna punch the other front row, and try and punch the the my job to punch the hooker in the head, like the other hooker. Our front row wasn't really bound either. And so what, as soon as I, if I was, I was supposed to like punch the wire hook, the other ho- opposition hooker in the head, he would come up getting all angry. Our props would just straight like start punching them because they they, were, they knew it was coming. You know, they went bound up, and he was the like their front row all stuck together. And so that was one of the one of the the first tactics that they they tried to teach me as an eighteen year old <laughs> to try to soften up the other team or to try like you know that was a. Just the uh, was um, psychological tactics as well, you know, back then. But um, so it was a bit of a mixture of uh, fighting and uh, rugby. <laughs> 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 and I suppose that even if, if if you look at like um, I don't know if you know much about hockey, but that's sort of it's part of the game there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so even uh, uh, Australian rules, it's a little bit of a part of that game as well. So it's sort of but they wanted to sort of stamp that out in rugby, but they definitely did that with the the fining and the, the weeks off and all that, that's sort of pretty much, t- I don't know, I haven't really seen any punches thrown since then, you know. It's all just this one now. You boogie, you boogie. <laughs> just pulling the jersey and, and then he nobody's ever going to... get your yellow, can't it, if you accidentally touch the yeah, tin, then it's yeah, yeah, that's right, but uh, just now with the ability to go back and, and, and to, to scrutinise everything on video... Mm-hmm. You know, I remember a lot of the games that we played, they weren't like, especially even with Northland, they weren't on TV, you know. It's so, just pretty yeah. much his word against his to the referee. Yeah, yeah. Somebody's lying on the ground and, oh, he punched me. They're going to punch him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. I See, in our days, if you were to even throw half a punch, you've got about 15 different angles. Yeah. Like, and you've got the slow mo. 
Yeah, slow mo with a crowd yeah, going. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, that's it. Man. To connect. Yeah, but yeah. Our times have changed, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and it happened pretty quickly. So next one, we have got who is the best player you have played with, and I assume it's not going to be someone that you have exchanged fists with <laughs> on the rugby field. I, I don't think you can go past Jonah, and just in terms of just like uh, uh, freak of nature. Yeah, it's just somebody who's like unbelievable. Really, he could do things still to this day that nobody else can do. Yeah. Nobody else has ever done. You don't see somebody like breaking like eight tackles, scoring like tries, and sprinting around like guys half his size. I guess we've got another one there, which is if you could change one thing in your career, what would it be? Yeah, good question. Probably yeah. Uh... When I was 20, just when I just turned 21, I, in a speed test, I tore a muscle out of my leg. Uh, if I could change that, and it just uh, it affected the, the way that I ran for the rest of my career, you know, it sort of put my body out of balance. Yeah. So I just started tearing muscles left, right, and center. I couldn't, I couldn't run freely from that day. That was my second year professional. So for the rest of my rugby career, I couldn't run very well, so... If I could change anything, I would change that injury. I wouldn't yeah. do that. <laughs> I wouldn't do that test because one of the things for me, I was at, I was athletic. You know, there were, I was light, I was skinny. Yeah, I was skillful. I was skinny, and I was athletic. You know what I mean? So those are my three. Like, oh, and I was a little bit crazy. So those are like my four sort of pillars of what sort of was my point of difference. You know. Yeah. And so, because when I went down to the Crusaders for the first time, I was like 90.4 kgs, you know, and it was just like, man, what's this going on? I was weak. You know, I wasn't strong. I've never been to the gym before in my whole life, you know, but I was quick. So that was the, I remember the trainer was just like, oh, wow, this, is, um, this guy's quick, you know, he's got, he's got, he's athletic. So that was the, oh, that was my point of difference. But then, so that second year, when I did that test, I was like going for, was me and Scott Robinson were going for the fastest forward, you know. <laughs> so I thought, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll give this one like a bit, a bit extra, and just bang! So it's all the whole muscle in the front of my leg. The, it's called the rectus femoris. It's one of the quads, mm-hmm. just the one that run right at the front of your leg. Snapped yeah. it in half. So Jeez. it was like, and then I was back within playing within four weeks. So I didn't really get a chance to rebalance my body. So I was hopping like one the whole season. I was like hopping like on one leg, and like couldn't yeah. raise my leg up properly. And then it did something to my back. And then after that, it was just ripping groins, hamstrings, you name it. I couldn't run properly. So I had to adapt my style of rugby after that. So I had to become yeah. more defensive-minded, you know. I used to, like, score tries. And and after that, I never scored any tries. And I just was just became like a battering ram, you know. Yeah. Um, and it took a lot of the enjoyment out of my game and one of the pillars of, you know, what made me different. So I was weak, skinny. Now slow, <laughs> mm. so it's yeah. sort of like uh, I lost one of my, uh, you know, one of my, yeah. uh, one of my things. So if I was to change something, I would change that. But then at the same time, uh, I don't know. I probably would have broken heaps of other things if I could have run pro- properly. I would have probably <laughs> knocked myself out a few more times. Yeah, just more speed into contact, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Probably <laughs> saved me, saved my body. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Did you keep the crazy throughout, though? Oh, no, I had to try and change that one as well because <laughs> it's sort of like after a while, the crazy sort of the, the body wasn't enjoying the crazy, you know? Yeah. So that was sort of like, what it wasn't a very sustainable style of playing, you know? Mm. So I, I, I got to the stage where it was like I had to make a decision. Well, do you want to keep on playing or do you want to just because the body was just like pretty much spazzing me, like, well, just like locking up, you know? Yeah. So every time I sort of overextended, my body would it would there would wouldn't be a there wouldn't be any intermediate. There would just be like dysfunction. Yeah. So it was like when you're playing and you can't run or something your back's locked up or something's jammed, it's not it's not so much fun, you know. So you have to you have to, try, have to try and find a different way. Yeah, I needed to try and learn to be a little bit more intelligent, you know, which was a, wasn't that easy for me because i guess like as a lock as well every time you lift it up and put back down that's just yeah. like a sh- pretty much a shock through your whole body isn't it yeah yeah it's not so bad in the game problems with training so because if you think about training it's like 
in the game, I don't know how many lineouts would you have. Like, you'd be lucky to have like ten lineouts to go into you, or whatever. But you'd probably jump in in yeah. the opposition, yes. And you don't get put down a lot of the time because they'll put you up, and then the ball's gone, and you'll just land, you know. But yeah. it's not so bad because it's on the grass, you know. But a lot of the other training, you're on the concrete, and when you're doing lineouts, you're just doing the one after another. So you're talking about hundreds, and yeah. then you got one guy, yeah. So that sort of, uh, yeah, my back after that, after a lot of the time, man, that was. Um, I got another funny story. I probably can't tell him here, but uh, um, just had my <laughs> one of my back locked up before and for one of the games from a line out, just landing like in the on, on the concrete. But yeah, that was uh, yeah. But then if you think about that, and then you think about the scrum training, yeah, that's just all on the spine. And you think about hitting the rocks, and you think about tackling. You're right, it's just all the different impacts, bam, 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 through your spine, you know. The game's not really the issue. It's, it's just the training. And like you said, once you've got injuries in certain spots, whether it be joints or whatever it is, it just takes one knock and bang, it's just, it's just, it's just yeah. you're repeating that injury, you know. And the, one of the things as well, just the nature of professional rugby, is that your injuries don't get a chance to heal. So like a normal person, like if you do something, if you break your finger or something like that, you know, you you heal it up and then it'll, it'll be fine, you know, if you, if you, yeah. if you do, it, do it well. But say for an example, like, like a broken finger, you've got to be, you, you're not going to let that stop you playing, so you strap it up and then you've got to be continuously trying to do weights. You're trying to do weights on that, that finger and sort of it's not healing properly, you know, you're not letting it heal. Yeah. It's not giving it time to heal. So it's... A lot of injuries you're carrying, you're, you're either pushing, you're coming back too early, or you're training on top of them as well. Yeah. Um, and so they're not really healed. They're not fully healed. And so you've got a lot of joints and things like that. And so you're just continuously hurting these areas that already hurt. So all these players that are playing, it's, it's easy to see from the sideline, like, oh, man, he's not playing very well today. or You know what I mean? Mm. And, um, and, but they're carrying injuries. All of them are carrying injuries. You know, to different degrees. You know, some of them worse than others. Some of them painful. You know what I mean? You got ribs and things like that. Maybe you're getting injections before the games. Some of the other things is it's a pity as well. It's like some of these guys. Like I remember uh, Christian Cullen. I think you know Christian Cullen was a great player. You know, but he just he got that one knee injury and didn't yeah. heal properly. You know, I don't know if he was let down by the medical staff or whatever. And then that was pretty much the end of his career. You know, he sort of tried to come back, but was just because speed was his number one thing, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, this is uh, t- the tough part about the, the professional rugby that you don't see, you know? Yeah. Because, mm, I mean, like, the amount of force that's, like, created per contact as well. Like, mm. it's pretty much like, hey, let's just chuck a fridge at you. Like, it's, yeah. it's not exactly light contact. So just having that, yeah. like, 20 times a game or something like that, mm. Plus the training, like you mentioned, it's yeah. like it just slowly keeps on wearing away. So that's why it's so yeah. impressive when you see someone like a Sam Whitelock or a yeah. Brody Retallick or that's right. one of these guys, Richie McCaw, who are around for so long yeah. and continued to be able to perform. Like Sam Kane yeah. gets a little bit of a bad like rap at yeah. times as yeah. well, but he's still going. Like he's been around yeah. for a long time. He's taken a lot of injuries, but... Yeah. just continues to keep on pushing. Yeah, uh, and it's a few, there's a little bit to that, I think, as well. You know, obviously, it's sort of like um, positional-wise as well. Different positions have different impacts in different ways, yeah. you know. Um, obviously, there's genetics as well. Like, uh, I was always tall and skinny, so my joints were susceptible to injuries, you know. And there was also, like, lifestyle as well. Like, back then, it was like, <laughs> we didn't really look after each other ourselves that well, but now they... More professional, you know. Yeah. We didn't really look after our injuries then. We were sort of we were doing whatever we wanted to do, and now there's sort of a lot, you know. The, the, it's a career now, and the other thing as well is it's a little the risk factor. We talked about being crazy as well. I think sometimes it's it can be a little bit more conservative now. Yeah, in some ways, you know what I mean. If you look at it from a career point of it point of view, I didn't. I never looked at it as a career point of view. I just wanted to go as hard as possible, you know, and. Uh, I didn't really see it as a way to set myself up or whatever. So I retired when I was 29. I was still 29 when I retired. So a lot of uh, these guys go through to the late 30s now. Mm. So um, yeah, if you think about it that way, you think, well, can I do my job and not like really like smash myself to pieces, you know? 
Mm. Um, I suppose that's the question, you know, could I do a, just as good a job without <laughs> without having to uh, suffer the repercussions? And uh, that's where I got to probably in my last probably year, but it was a bit late for me. Yeah. So you mentioned 29 as your retirement. Yeah. There's a player in the NRL slash now he's transferred over to Rugby Union. We were talking about him a little bit beforehand for Roger Tuovasa Sheik. And I guess a big question for me, I'm going to change the question just a little bit here. And I guess for anyone who is transitioning from another sport, such as rugby league to rugby union, what's a big tip that you would give them to be able to help them towards getting to an AB's jersey? Like kind of one little key that you think that they will have to try and adapt to come to union. Yeah, I suppose he he would he'd be better off to talk to somebody who's already done it, you know. Like a yeah. Sonny Bull or somebody, you know, Sonny Bull would probably be a great resource to for him to sort of somebody who's been through that and understood the challenges or the difference. And you know, I think one of the obviously the biggest difference is the flow of the game yeah. from rugby league to rugby. You know, it's there's um there's a different tempo. Obviously, with the rugby league, it's sort of, it's more consistent in terms of the timing. You know, there's a there's a certain amount of time, and then you sort of can you go off that sort of like a stop start, stop start, stop start. With the rugby, you sort of got a ruck which is can be longer or shorter. You know, and so that sort of that changes the the flow of the game. You sort of run off the ball or different things. You know, the line speed of the de- of the defence. You know. So, um, yeah, I suppose that would be my thing is to, yeah, talk with somebody who's done it. I'm mm. definitely not that one, not the man for that. <laughs> no. Would you have even given rugby league a go if the yeah. opportunity came up? Yeah, yeah, I would have loved to have played rugby league. I actually played league for five years before rugby, so I started okay. off playing rugby league, yeah. I was, I, my first season of rugby was under 14s. That was that was after five years of rugby league. So yeah. I think it's a great sport to learn the basics before you go to rugby. You know, you don't really yeah. need to learn rucks and things like that, lineouts when you're young. You know, but you learn it. You need to learn how to tackle and get in within a line and yeah. run with the ball. You know, I think it's a good intermediate game to step onto rugby. You know, because they always say that sevens as well is very good for union because of that extra little bit that you got to do out on the field with the fitness kind of side of things, how yeah. like you got to cover everywhere with just your seven guys. Yeah. And normally, like, the amount that these players in our days can just run, like, even the props, like, down mm, the yeah. wing, yeah. like, they're all quicker than me. I know that for a yeah. fact, but they right, just yeah. still steamroll over everyone. That's right. The That's right. Mm. They're incredible athletes. Well, I did, like, a um, – over here in uh, uh, in Spain, I was, like, a uh, – I worked for the rugby union, which was um, within the province, and so I did like a, a big study of the like the, all the different clubs that that work within this province here. It's like a big, quite a big province called Galicia. It's like three million people. It's but it's not so many rugby clubs. I think it's like thirteen or fourteen rugby clubs within that. And so my suggestion for them was to get the kids because the 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 kids they can't tackle. You know, they they don't know anything about defense you know so sort of like my suggestion was them to get the kids to play rugby league you know so up yeah. until 13 or 14 then switch them to rugby there teach them about the rucks and then afterwards so you train them with rugby league teach them rugby because then you can't avoid tackling you can't yeah. avoid running with the ball if you're if you're playing rugby and you don't really know what you're doing like a lot of the pl- coaches and players over here the, the, it's just a mess there's no structure just like seagulls, you know what I mean? And so a lot of the players aren't doing anything. But you get them in a line, and they have to run the ball, and they have to tackle. You have to teach them how to tackle. It's yeah. obvious. You know what I mean? You've got the core skills. You need those core skills to be able to create rugby. If you don't know how to tackle, you don't know how to hold on to the ball, you don't know how to run with the ball, you haven't got your your core skills, you know? Yeah. So, um, But this is why I think New Zealand as well, we like – why we're a little bit different to the rest of the world, we play these rugby-related activities, you know? Like, we play held, you know? And held's an yep. interesting game as well because it's, like, a little bit slower. So you get to learn sort of through through sort of slow movements, you know? Walking. Walking touch or held, you know? And they don't play that over here. In these, in the, in these, they, they just have trainings. They just do it twice a week. And then they got football, you know? They play football. Mm-hmm. You put any of these Spanish, French, English on a football field, they're amazing, you know what I mean? The rugby players, they can play football. 
they're incredible. Um, yeah. Just because that's the activity they they do, they do it at school or they do it on the courtyard or whatever. You know? So I'm a big fan of rugby league in terms of just um, learning the basics. Would you ever go back into coaching? Do you think? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I want to. Like uh, my my thing was sort of like I, I learned on the job. You know, whatever I did was rugby or whatever. You know, didn't do academies. I learned from playing. You know, I learned coaching from coaching. You know, I never did a lot of study around it or anything like that. So. And so I've only really coached like over here for like six years, six or seven years here over here, uh, you know, just with one club, you know. And so maybe I would be interested just to test, test it out because it's, uh, I don't know, I thought uh, I enjoyed it in some ways. In some ways it uh, was a little bit like tedious, but I was know, interested in doing it somewhere else to see when you're only coaching in one place, you know, you don't know, is it is it, is it me that's, a shit coach or was it the players? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And so um, it's sort of like, wow, well, my, put it this way, we, we you know, the, the, my coaching career here was, uh, is, is, you know, interesting in some ways, but it's um, uh, just the club that I was involved with where, man, they were just pretty much a shambles in terms of like the, the uh, management side of it, so it made it very, very difficult. You know, we didn't have a lot of player base, and it was challenging. We just we did some good things, but there was some. It was really it was quite hard as well at the same time. So yeah, it would be it would be cool to go to a different setup. Part of it was attractive for me because it's amateur, you know, it's semi professional. Uh, I never really wanted to go into like a a super strict sort of um, professional setup. That's why I sort of uh, was attracted to that um, sort of style. And so it comes to these pros and cons with that, you know. Some of it's cool, like, in terms of, like, not so many protocols, it's not so many things you need to do. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, there's just, like, people late to training, things not being organised properly, you know, the right equipment, you know. And so sometimes you're sort of you, you're coaching with your hand, one of your hands tied behind your back as well, you know. You don't have the resources. Sometimes we have to like you when know, we we had to like bus to Barcelona, which is like fourteen hours, you know, fourteen hours to play a game, and fourteen hours to come back, you know. And so yeah. there's some challenging guys have to work; they can't go away. So a few times we used to go away, we had like fourteen, fifteen players, you know. You try and go, <laughs> you go away and play with like fifteen players, you get one injury, yeah. and it's like you know what I mean. And so mm. part of it's like, man, maybe I'd like to coach with like a bit with a the club that's um, a little bit more well organised, and a bigger but, squad, um, perhaps as well. Yeah, bigger squad. <laughs> it's just different, like man. Sometimes they have three, three at training, four at training. You know what I mean? Six at training. Yeah. It's like, man, what can you do with that? You know, and a different, mm. and different players on a Tuesday than a Thursday <laughs> than a Saturday. Always different, you know. Because yeah. the other thing as well is that. Rugby's not that popular in the area that I'm at, so we had to draw from players like two hours away. So they'd come for two hours to training and two hours back. So yeah. we're training at 8.30 at night, you know what I mean? And so we'd finish at like 10.30, and these guys will get back home at like 12.30 at night, you know? And so yeah. sometimes they, they'll all come in the same car, or that car's not coming, so these got all these players that we come from, from two hours away, they wouldn't come, you know? Or yeah. ice working, and uh, it just makes it makes it very difficult, man. It's just the area that I was coaching, you know. Some of yeah. some of it was good, but um, I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe, um, maybe I'd like to coach in New Zealand. Maybe, you know. maybe future video could be Norm Maxwell trains the Kiwi lads for a game of rugby. That would, <laughs> that would be testing. I feel like you'd see how unfit I really am. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well. I'm, I'm an expert at uh, training bloody lepers anyway, so you'd be right, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, I guess that is almost going to be the end of our birthday Q&A. Hopefully you have enjoyed it, mate. Hopefully we can get a part two, maybe. I feel like there's still a lot of unanswered questions that we could go down the lines of, uh, if you are. Yeah, maybe. I suppose it's just yeah, it's the old school sort of rugby. I know it's a little bit different. I think... Um, yeah. Like I said, uh, when we talked about before, it's, I think there's a little bit of a gap that's um, sort of started to, you know, get wider and wider from the sort of grassroots or the rugby supporter and the and the professional franchises and the professional players, you know. And so 
Yeah. I'll be interested to see if we could bridge that gap back together a little bit, you know, because at the end of the day, it's um, rugby is the, you know, the, the glue that sort of holds us together. And maybe I'd like to play a part in seeing how we can bridge that back together, you know, especially within New Zealand. Sounds like a good plan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure hopefully we can find something in the future. I mean, that's the thing. If you ever wanted a role as some sort of analytics fellow at the Kiwi Lads Enterprises, you've got yourself the job, mate. Yeah. And we can. That's it, man. We that's can work it. on it from there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you might be sending me out to to be a um a ring in for the uh, for the the table tennis tournament, man. I'm, I'm not too well, bad, you, you know. Yeah, yeah, you're decent at table tennis. Well, you know, I wouldn't say I was professional, but. Uh, you know, I've, I've, had, I've, I've spent a little bit of time in the odd garage here and there, man. Yeah, well, we've got a table tennis table here, so if you're ever back in New Zealand, feel free to yeah. pop it and we can have a game. Yeah, that's right. I remember I played a game with my mate over in uh, over in London. He had a table tennis table, and I was playing some of those guys, and these guys had these crazy serves, you know. I was like, man, where did you guys get this from? And now yeah. it's all internet. <laughs> Now they're all looking on the internet, you know, everything on the internet now, you know, YouTube, you can look up all these different shots on how to practice like proper table tennis, you know, you yeah. get the real deal from the professionals, you know. So these guys were cracking out all these like serves that were like crazy. I was like, man, so yeah, so I might have to do a bit of upskilling on, 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 on YouTube. It's add to my initial flair of uh, experience of uh, <laughs> these garages and it'll be, uh, that'll be the winning combo, man. Probably will be. To be honest, yeah. like that's the thing. I get lucky with the shots that I play. I just put my paddle out, and luckily it hits it. But I have to give that a go. Black, Tell you what, we got we got video ideas all over the place at the moment. We're gonna have to write these ones down. <laughs> yeah, nonetheless, I guess that is gonna be the end of our birthday Q and A. If you did enjoy this and you do want to see more of this in the future, do let us know in the comments down below. But thank you all very much for tuning in. Thank you very much once again, Norm, for coming on the no, channel, mate. No problem. I hope I didn't bore you too much with the stories from the old days, mate. No, yeah. I was loving it. Loving it. We need to do a second part of this, I think. I was learning so much, you know, of what happens when someone falls asleep when they're drunk and how you blame the trophy on them. <laughs> or <laughs> That's it, man. Keep your, you got to keep your wits about you, my brother. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you all very much for tuning in, and we will see you all for the next one.